welcome everyone. Thank you for um, joining us today for this meeting on um, time series generation and anomaly detection. So um, I was going to quickly outline as the sort of talks today. So we've got two talks live. So Terry Lyons will speak first, um, and then Lucas Sprout, um will give us live talks, and we're going to follow that up with some um, discussions of pre-recorded talks. So hopefully. Um, many of you have had a chance to, to watch these pre-recorded talks and Peter and Renuan will be here to to talk a bit about their paper with, with some of us and answer some questions and then it, we, we'll, we hope to wrap up with a, a little bit of a general discussion thinking about some some general questions on, on this topic. Um, the first two talks, the live talks, we hope to record so there will be recording going on. You've probably already been notified of that but um, just to let you know that that's happening. But um, OK, so the first talk we have today is from Terry Lyons, who's going to talk about treating paths as a data type. So Terry, do you want to share your slide? Yep, thank you very much. Uh, hope it works. I think that's that's the one to go for and then I think if we do that can you confirm that you do not have a bar of my icons at the bottom yeah yeah that, that looks good good okay. okay right so thank you very very much for having me here today it's a great pleasure and um, I want to talk today about something which sort of spans at least a decade of thinking um, this is really how to represent stream data. Um, many of you have heard vaguely about rough path theory and things like that, but at the heart of rough path theory is exactly this question. How should you describe complex multimodal evolving data? And that's what I mean by stream. I think it's very tempting to believe, and indeed when I started, I probably expressed this perspective as well, that you know you can't do sensible analysis or understanding of data about something complicated without knowing about the complicated thing. In other words, that the analysis is context driven. In a sense, that's a very non-mathematical approach that says we haven't axiomatized, extracted out a good enough structure to do things. Um, you know, we really don't expect our calculator when it's doing arithmetic to pay attention to whether it's counting ideas or counting Lamborghinis. Um, it really makes no difference to the analysis and the way the calculator works. Now, I don't believe completely at all that you can do the most refined analysis without thinking about the context. I, I believe quite strongly that's wrong. But I do believe that we can get a better grip on stream data than we normally manage, and that there is powerful mathematics to help us achieve that goal. So streams come in many different forms. And what I'm going to be focusing on today, if you like, is how to unify the perspective. As I say at the end, I don't really believe that completely at all, but I do believe that it's an important part, understanding what you can say without reference to the individual contexts. And I'm thinking of things like what I would call modern complicated data, um, something like the way that a patient's health record evolves when they're in an intensive care unit, or a movie. That also is obviously a multimodal evolving sequence. Financial data, in some sense, is a relatively simple one. And this funny piece of writing, uh, scriggle or squiggle on the right, is actually a piece of text encoded to persuade you that you can think of it as a path. All of these are a lot more complicated than something like Brownian motion or a Markov chain. Um, and I think there's a tendency to run away from them. You see, I gave a talk recently, and in fact, it redesigned this talk as a result, where one of my colleagues said, oh, what you do is much too applied. I think it's much simpler. And I don't think it's applied or pure. I think it's quite precise mathematically. And that's what I'm going to try and convey, that you can think about these things in a mathematical way, 
that is actually quite precise. And in doing so, you get many other advantages because you have standardized computational frameworks. You can push quite different data into the same underlying analysis and so on. So I'm going to try in the next few slides to explain this. First of all, I'm going to say I don't think the classic time series paradigm, I'm sure you, many people in this room agree with that, is the, is the ideal solution. The lesson we learned from rough path theory, actually, is that it's a very bad solution. You can actually construct mathematical examples to show that understanding a stream like a Brownian path just by evaluating it at times the sort of Kolmogorov perspective of what is a path as a function of time is very inefficient. And it's so inefficient that if you have something worse than a fractional than a Brownian motion, a fractional Brownian motion with index uh, less than a half, it's not even adequate. The responses of your system are not even measurable with respect to the values of the function. So you need a new way to talk about streams of data, or you get incredibly bogged down with the microstructure. Um, and the fundamental change was to stop thinking of it as a value evolving in time and instead start to think about it as an object which you can query over an interval. And if you query it over an interval, you can get a description of what's going on in that interval. And how do you measure that description? Well, more like a physicist, you think in terms of its effects. And the sort of piece of mathematics is there, which I'm going to try and hint at over the next slide or two, is that the piece of mathematics um, tells you that you don't need, going back to my original point of do you need to know about the context, the answer is you don't. There's a way of looking at that path and understanding that path by testing its effects on stereotype mathematical nonlinear systems that can give a local description that's sound enough and robust enough that it can then predict what's going to happen in real world situations. And this, if you like, is the fundamental theorem of rough path theory. And I'm going to try over this talk to take you through from that perspective to understanding some of the things we're doing today in the data science context. But the main test I would like you to apply to whether you think your natural approach to analyzing multimodal data is a good one or not, is if you're faced with two channels, and I've here got Google and Apple prices, do you treat them separately? and then do some analysis at the end? Or do you have natural feature sets that grab the way they interact with each other? And the Google Apple one, maybe it doesn't matter whether they interact with each other. But if, for example, your data streams were the delivery of bread into a supermarket and the consumption of bread by customers taking it off the shelves, then it's very clear that on a micro scale, there is a real interaction between these two streams that needs to be modeled and taken into account. Same will be with people getting on buses or anything else. There are a huge number of situations where there is a genuine interleaving of the different channels and you need to better model it. Wavelets, these sorts of things actually fail dismally in this respect because they actually restore each channel separately. And then if you want to understand these things, you have to better restore things so finely and successfully that you can see how they interleave. You can understand the jitter, if you like. So this is the sort of data I would like to look at. This particular data is by one of, uh, was put together by one of my postdocs, uh, Mohammed, and here we're trying to anal analyze a limited sample of video data um, from the 800 TFL cameras around the main routes in London. And we'd like to translate that into data that we can analyze successfully, we don't know that yet, um, to predict things like pollution or congestion, number of standing cars, all that sort of thing. And 
I think it's a very interesting data set because at one level, I am not going to do what I preach. The first level in the data processing, we're taking the raw video and we're turning it into something much more like a MIDI script where you have bicycles moving and you, that's one of these dotted lines and you record the times at which it, the, it moves and which it, position it is and cars and so on. That bit, in fact, we're just using off the peg tools for framing everything and so on. And um, if you like, we're using other people's expert knowledge in how to analyze video. But the right hand side is already an interesting time series because it illustrates so many of the problems. Right. So you've got 800 of these little streams at any given time. And you don't have it all the time because for privacy reasons, it gets snapshotted. You don't have a fixed number of anything. You don't have fixed time periods for a person in the scene. It's a very typical, modern, complex data stream. And I would like to understand and mathematize well enough that we can analyze that kind of data stream without having to develop specific fudges, or at least very few of them. Um, and just to illustrate the variety, I wanted to show some other data streams that I've played with in science. So this is actually a path as that person is moving. It's a path, I think, in a 15 dimensional space. Uh, maybe 24, I can't remember. Um, but basically, the position is determined, the state is determined by the position of the joints on the screen and they evolve in time. And again, we would like to understand that short path in 20 dimensional space or whatever. And we would like to understand it well enough that we can actually understand what the human eye can certainly understand. The action the person is doing. And uh, to me, I want to put both sets of data and many others from health and all the rest of it onto the same platform, if you like. And the array is incredible. The first real serious application of using this of, of signatures, which is what we're going to be talking about, was actually by Ben Graham, who was then at Warwick, but of course is now in Facebook. Um, well, it's not called Facebook anymore, is it? Uh, but anyway, um, he's at Facebook, well, the meta, I suppose it's called. Um, was actually to understand how to translate a stream of information, which was actually somebody's figure, finger moving across the screen of a mobile phone into Chinese characters. And as I think is by now relatively well known, he won a competition to do that, a pretty heavily competitive competition by blending signatures and um, convolutional neural nets. And that went on to become a commercially successful application uh, in it, by going first through South China University of Technology that engineered it into a product uh, that sat in your mobile phone. And then they passed it on to one of the large Chinese companies. And for many years, that Chinese company acknowledged their contributions to their software and um, that company has something like 500 million users for this soft, for the overall software package. It should be emphasized that the, the finger motions is not by any means the most important part of that opinion is far more important. And I think some survey said that 20% of users thought the handwriting was important. But anyway, lots of examples and rich examples, and I think very contemporary examples. But I wanted also to pick up on two other points that are interesting and also relevant to today's topic of extreme of outliers and so on, is that not only do you often deal with streams, you often deal with clouds of streams, ensembles of streams. That's what we saw in that picture, if you think about it. We saw cars, each car was naturally a stream. But there was not one car, but many cars, bicycles, so on and so forth. So streams of data are another important class. Uh, so ensembles of streams of data are an important class. 
they're not just a high dimensional stream because they're sort of exchangeable. The labels on the different streams don't matter. And the sort of questions I would like to have basic theory for are how to describe what we've observed abstractly, how to predict the law of what happens next, how to identify anomalous behavior. And there's been progress in all of these directions. Now I want to do some maths. <clears throat> I want really to give a mathematical explanation of my claim at the beginning that it's possible to think about stream data separately from what it's going to do and why you're interested in it. So the reason, you know, the same way that a calculator analyzes numbers without feeling obliged to decide in advance the units those numbers refer to. And the key goes back really to Newton and to control differential equations. I mean, Newton didn't just invent calculus. In fact, he really did understand, partly because of his interest in gravity and force at a distance, the idea of a controlled differential equation where the evolution of one system can impact on the behavior of another system. So the planets, I mean, the gravity is a good example of this. So I want you to think a little bit about simply a differential equation of this kind. I've written it in the simplest form. Hold on. Whoops. I've, in the simplest form, um, with no d by du's and things. Um, but basically, y is the response, x is the control, and f is the physics. And F is actually a linear map, if you're thinking mathematically, from the space where X lives into the vector fields on the dynamics on where Y lives. So you see what happens is a little increment of X gets translated into a direction for Y and tells how Y how to evolve. It's a very simple system. It's a very powerful system. And if we go back to my suggestion that the right way to think about paths is in terms of their effect. Now you begin to see that I'm, I'm, I'm sort of going to regard the importance of X over an interval of time in terms of what Y does. So if we think about where Y begins, where Y ends, its effect on the system Y. And this is a good way of understanding how we're understanding paths, because it if F is smooth, then actually we're not going to care completely about the fine structure of X. If X oscillates a lot, we're going to be able to extract macroscopic features of that oscillation that are sufficient to predict Y to arbitrarily good approximation. But something magic happens in this, which is easiest to see in the linear case. So if we think of F as being linear, it becomes a, a linear map from the X space into the linear maps on the Y space. So it's a three index matrix, if you like, or tensor. And um, in that case, if we write down Picard iteration, the classical way of seeing how to approximate a solution, you get a very interesting series. And it converges easily. And it has a number of components. It has where you start and where you finish. And it's a linear map. So this thing has to be linear. But what is this linear map? It's a contraction of the A multiple times. I'll leave you to figure out how all the indices work. But there's only one way to put them together logically. Um, times, these are objects which basically look pretty horrible and are pretty horrible in a sense, the iterated integrals of my of my driving signal. It just comes completely naturally from Picard iteration. And if X was a scalar path, this would just be X to the N over M factorial. But X is not a scalar path in general. And these quantities actually decay factorially fast. So even though this object may grow exponentially, this series converges and only a very well-defined number of terms contribute to the answer. So in other words, we have something very interesting. We have a feature set for our path 
It doesn't depend on A at all. It doesn't depend on the physics. It doesn't depend on F. We have a feature set that describes all we need to know about X without any reference to the particular equation that we're looking at. And actually, it latches us into a huge amount of classical mathematics that was worked out very well in the 50s and the 60s, uh, freely algebras, tensor algebras, and things like that. Um, so it latches us into mathematics, and there's a lot to be said. What are natural bases? There's all sorts of things which I can't possibly get involved in today. But it makes a very strong bond between stream data, its effects, and an adequate feature set to understand them. So you don't typically study this feature set over the whole time interval because these terms grow exponentially. What you do, and this is rough path theory again, is you study this feature set over moderate length intervals where moderate is measured by how quickly F changes. And you don't need to take all the terms. You only need to take iterated integrals up to a degree that corresponds to how rough and complicated the signal oscillatory, the signal X is. So for a smooth path, you only need to use level one, and that's what Newton did. Um, it's a remarkable separation, and I think conceptually it's a very important point that we have a way of understanding the data that is relevant and effective that doesn't depend on the particular problem. It's also non-trivial, and one should take advantage of that understanding, perhaps before one runs off to the particular problem. So to live up to what I said before, you don't actually need to understand what happens to F or with, with a given F. There's a generic approach. Now, I said we could look at all these coefficients, but the neatest way to think about all these coefficients, the signature of the path over a time interval ST, is to think about this differential equation. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at my path x, my stream x, I'm going to understand it by its effect on this mathematically contrived nonlinear system. I'm going to look at the response of this very simple linear system, actually, um, which you recognize, I hope, that if I took away this fancy tensor product, would just be the exponential function. But this is, if you like, an absolutely non-commutative version of the exponential function. And well, that, in a nutshell, is the key idea, that one can understand the consequences of X over long intervals by understanding the consequences of X on these very simple, mathematically invented nonlinear systems over short time intervals. And moreover, we don't actually need to know it's an arbitrary degree. We only need to understand the first few terms, where the first few terms is measured in terms of the complexity, the roughness of X. So if X is a smooth path, then increments will do fine. And if X is a Brownian path, you need increments and areas. If X gets more complex, you'll find you need more. Funnily enough, it's not really whether the path is smooth or not that matters. It's how smooth it is on the scale you want to operate. Even if the path is completely smooth on some very fine scale, it can still be massively economical to describe it on the scale you're interested in using a first few terms in a signature. It's a way of condensing and hiding, if you like, all the fine structure and just recording enough to understand the consequences on the Fs we're interested in. But it's sort of a different way of looking at the thing. Rather than trying to describe our book by telling you that on the 17th page, on the 52nd line, the third word was the, which is what a normal time series would tell you, it looks at the effect of the text of a chapter in the text or a sentence or a paragraph. And the signature can easily be understood to be a sort of a macroscopic description. 
And I haven't got time in this talk, but the, the nice way of distinguishing between Jacobian tragedies and Jacobian comedies simply by looking at the signature and looking at happy words and sad words. Um, it really is the case that this is a sort of good way to analyze complex oscillatory time series and ordinary time series if they're multimodal. So I hope up to now I've sold you a little bit on the. I want to now explain to you a second reason why the signature is a good idea. And in fact, why I didn't write any DTs in those differential equations. You never need to write a DT term in a differential equation if you don't want to. You can think of T as being part of your driving signal. <coughs> and you simply enhance your data stream to have a, a variable that's time in it. And that's actually a good idea because then you separate out two things that we often confuse. That's sampling rate and time. Actually, in financial data, there are many different variations on time. There's traded volume, there's accumulated volatility, there's clock time, many different notions of time. Um, and they can all coexist in X. But there's a symmetry in, in time series data that is often ignored, and it's ignored at our peril. If you do machine learning, then symmetries are very bad news, basically, because what they mean is there are different representations of the same data. So if you want to recognize that something is true, you have to learn first that there are all these different ways of representing it, and they all mean the same thing. And one of the most common symmetries, of course, is a simple one like rotation, which is two dimensional and probably easy to sort out. One of the more insidious ones is the speed at which you parameterize data. Now, you can tell that this is a problem because people write books about missing data. And they shouldn't, because actually, if you represented your path using signatures, that sort of issue isn't an issue. What we want is a way to represent this three that doesn't take account of whether we drew it quickly or slowly. Because that's the only difference between these parts. This is the X coordinate of the three twice. And this is the Y coordinate twice. And the only difference between them is that you one we did it quickly at the beginning and one we did it quickly at the end. But you see, in terms of wavelet analysis and things and treating each coordinate separately, you can see there's a big problem in trying to recognize the patterns. But we all understand that the three is a three and it doesn't make a lot of difference how quickly we sample it. I do emphasize again, though, I'm talking about sampling rates. If time is important, and it often is, then you just treat it like X and Y as another coordinate. And once you start thinking like that, you realize that you don't actually need to worry too much about missing uh, irregularly sampled data. So long as the irregularly sampled data gives you enough information to know what the path is like. So the challenge is how on earth can you describe this three without parameterization? Well, the signature exactly does that. So the signature, this feature set we were looking at, is given by that differential equation. And unless you put time in, it's independent of parameterization. If you run the X a bit faster, you run Y a bit faster. But the beginning and the end will remain the same. So these signature feature sets ignore parameterization. They ignore sampling. They're just interested in the curve. And this is an infinite dimensional symmetry removal. It's a highly nonlinear, highly clever feature set that factors out the, the symmetry of reparameterization. And it makes a very big difference. You still have an exponential problem because unfortunately, multidimensional data evolving in time is always going to explode exponentially in terms of the amount of information it can carry. And there's a whole lot of interesting maths one could try to do to get better at that, but it always will. 
But you have actually succeeded in factoring out a huge infinite dimensional nonlinear group of symmetries that you no longer have to find by having huge amounts of data. And um, what's the word? Uh, augment your data to learn that the parameterization, the missing data, if you like, doesn't matter. Makes a big difference. And that actually, I think, is a point about how signatures work. Signatures are part of the armory. They're a feature set which used on dyadic intervals can be powerful at describing your path. They're mathematically interesting. They completely describe the path. That's the theorem up to parameterization. So if two paths have the same signature, then in a very precise generalized notion of reparameterization, they are the same path. And um, but they're not to be used on their own. They almost invariably are used like with Ben Graham as a tool along with convolutional neuralettes, along with other techniques, they simply prepare your problem better. Um, one of the important features of the signature is that it's universal. And what does that mean? Well, I've told you that it's faithful, but I think look at the second item here. Continuous functions on streams can be well approximated by linear functions of the signature. What this means, in fact, is easy to prove. It's a well-known combinatorial fact. That if I take two linear functionals on the signature, the signature is an object given by a, it's this representation, this feature describing our path over an interval. If I take two linear functionals of it, so two functions, real valued functions, and I multiply them together, obviously I get a new function, but it actually has a representation as another linear function using the shuffle products or whatever. So that means that the linear functions restricted to this feature set are actually an algebra, which means stone virus strauss universality on compact sets, every continuous function can be uniformly approximated by linear functions. And so actually you can do regression to find all functions and that's all a good thing. One of the consequences of that is that probability measures on these paths can be described by their center of gravity, by the expected signature. So expected signatures provide a powerful way of describing ensembles. Another interesting feature, which is mathematically um, exciting, really, I think, is that if you have an inner product structure on the space where X lives, you automatically have an inner product structure on kernels, or on signatures. And so you automatically have a kernel. What's interesting is that that kernel has a kernel trick, and that kernel trick is actually a PDE, a hyperbolic PDE. And you can, but you can solve it easily and you can use the GPU to get good answers out. So there's actually a natural signature, path signature kernel. And indeed, it's given by a PDE. And it measures, if you like, the inner product between two unparameterized paths. All, you know, maths interacting with data, some of it really useful, some of it potentially useful, but still very exciting, I think. You can go the other way. So here is an example written by Wei Xin Yang, um, but there's an alternative software by Jai Wei Chang, Jai Wei Chang and Adeline Fermanian, um, where you can go back from the signature to the path. This is interesting. And in fact, we were playing recently with using it for video data, um, where you break the, date, the video data up using a space filling curve, and then you can reconstruct it from signatures um, using this sort of algorithms. Um, but you can go the other way. It's a transform, and notice it, you know, it gets quite complicated structures. And this is the sort of data we look at. And um, yeah, this is actually a typical data set now. The left hand side one is a series of small paths. The right hand side one is actually trees of paths. And this one arises in cybersecurity. 
But you see, the signature allows one to convert these paths, all these expected signatures of paths, into vectors. And those vectors are of a fixed dimension according to how many degrees of signature you're prepared to look at. This is actually very powerful. It's a vectorization of your stream data. So you can apply standard anomaly methods, K nearest neighbor, all of these things to the vectorized data in meaningful ways. And know that actually the vectorizations are meaningful too. One of our projects at the moment is very much to make the sort of things on the right much more scalable so that we can look at higher dimensional features in the cybersecurity and get something useful out of it. I mentioned already that um, Ben Graham won the Chinese handwriting recognition competition that eventually ended up with his software being embedded into software that has a reach of 500 million people. Um, the rough path theory perspective was wildly generated, generalized by Martin Ira into spatial context. And of course, that led to his getting his field medal for regularity structures. Um, and more recently, his breakthrough prize. Um, but on the more stats and data oriented side, we haven't stopped. Um, James Murill got the first place in the PhysioNet Challenge for 2019 for early prediction of sepsis from clinical data, and that has since progressed into real world hospital type data. Um, and most recently, in the last couple of weeks, Hans Buller, who is a senior managing director in uh, JP Morgan, uh, got the risk.net award as quant of the year. And part of that was using signatures to more effectively synthesize financial data. And he used that to better train some fairly sophisticated um, neural models to allow pricing from data as opposed to pricing from models. And that's been a you know, sort of long theme of his. And one of the missing links, as he explained, was actually the signatures that I've been talking about today. Another way this all comes together is recently has been through neural control differential equations as parameterized models for um, functions between paths. And there, it, the differential equation is the object in the neural net, and you train it so as to get the right physics, if you like, to connect the paths. It turns out that being able to use the signatures to describe gamma is a very important reduction of dimensionality that makes this robust and good with irregular data, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I'm almost finished. Um, I don't want to run over. Yeah, I won't. I just finished with two problems, very different problems. One problem I would really like to see solved, and in a sense, formally, how and I mapped this out in the first paper that we wrote about signatures and data science. I think it's a very basic problem that merits far more generic attention than it receives. You have a cohort of streams. You could think of sentences, but you could think of people's lives um, as a very practical example. But the, the different context where this happens is enormous. You have cohorts of complex stream data. And then you have a single instance of a part of a life. Say my life up to my birthday today from my birth date to today. And what I'd like to be able to do is based on the evidence of what happens to everybody else, I would like 
to be able to give a description of my of the distribution of my future. And actually, the signature allows you to understand this as a simple regression problem. Because my future is the expected signature of what is about to come. And I have all these other people and their signatures. So you see, actually, what I'm trying to do is regression. I know their signatures up to this point in time. I know my signature up to this point in time. I know their signature from this point in time into the future. And what I would like to do is evaluate. So that's a random variable whose expectation is the expected signature. And what I'd like to do is evaluate my expected signature, my distribution of my future. It's a standard regression problem, albeit not independent or anything like that. And I think at the moment we see people talking about manifold learning, which is the same as nonlinear regression, really. Um, it looks to me as if we're moving to a point where actually maybe the statistical literature is able to give us a solution to these problems that can actually be really carried out. But that would be extremely exciting because actually this is a very, very generic problem. And if we can solve it at this very, very generic level, that's pretty exciting. You dump a whole load of data in. You dump your half data in and out drops the expected signature of what's going to happen to you. Personalized medicine. Very helpful. Um, yeah, I and mean, that's just explaining it. Very different sort of problem. Signatures are really cheap to compute. Modulo the size of the objects, which can be huge. As a result, it's possible to make really lightweight tools. Uh, for doing things like simple binary classification of images, do they contain a fire or not? But, you know, are orders of magnitude lighter and cheaper and better to implement than all the standard machine learning technologies? Um, basically, because they factor out this exponential challenge of um, reparameterization, you don't always need a neural net to sort things out. The linear functionals are already a rich enough class of functions and you just do a regression. OK, thank you very, very much for listening. I hope you found it interesting. I am winding up. Great. Thank you, Terry. Um, probably got time for one or two very quick questions from the audience. If anyone has a question for Terry. Uh, yeah, Kazina. Yeah, thank you for a brilliant talk. Uh, so many angles you covered. Um, what's dear to my heart is time series uh, of, of networks or sort of stream network data, networks of financial transactions. Um, yeah. Can you expand signatures? So, so I understand. So if I look at, at financial transactions, uh, so for each um, individual, we can track that by a signature. We can also have a bundle of signatures, but can we somehow track the network effect between the signatures because if I spend um, if, if I want to buy a new car my neighbor wants to buy a new car too so sure, um, sure you can sure you can okay so the, the right framework for that would be the paper of AI in AI stats by Maud Le Mercier and um, Chris Salvi and people where they they they, they look at um, so I would describe that as an ensemble of paths context, right? You've got a group of mm. paths. They're not labeled, right? There's an exchangeability between the people, typically. You're not worrying about which person is which. If you're labeling them with their address, no, you, 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 they're not, I think, because you can attach that information by label, by giving addresses, giving them extra data onto the individual. Um, and then, so each of them has a signature, okay? Mm -hmm. And so you would look at the expected signature because they're all simultaneously parameterized. They have a common parameterization. So even when we reparameterize them, we would reparameterize them at the same time. So the expected signature makes sense, but it doesn't just make sense at the end. It makes sense at every intermediate time, right? Mm -hmm. Because of that, you now have a new path, okay? So now you can really learn on that path. That path characterizes the evolving distribution 
of the cloud. Okay. Right? And including all the inner subtleties of it all. So it's a powerful object, but it's a big object. But what they did is they showed that using the kernel methods on this big object, they were able to get good analysis. The, the examples they looked at were agricultural, mainly, where they were looking at the behavior of um, crops in France, where you had different fields with different weather mm -hmm. and different policies in different regions and so on. Um, exactly sort of complex ensembles of parts uh, with interactions. There's no reason why you can't have interactions. And there's no reason why you can't learn those interactions. And there's no reason why you can't model them as well, if you really know enough about them mathematically. But yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly designed. It's good for that. Very good for that. OK, thank you. Thank you. I think there's another question from Lukas. Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, excellent talk, Terry. Um, <clears throat> Very brief question to the last part, the challenge that you described. I uh, just want to make sure that I understood this. Effectively, you were talking about when you were talking about this, you know, having a bunch of signatures and then you want to compute expected future based on one trajectory. You're talking about approximating conditional law given. Uh, I think that's the path. question. Right. Uh, what I'm proposing is that you can translate that into a problem of regression. Mm -hmm. That if you think of your random variable as being the signature, the expected signature as being the mean, then what you then yeah. the regression is trying to understand the function which gives you the expected values, given observations of the values. Okay. Right. So, so th what I'm saying is that it's pretty obvious from this perspective that you can reduce the problem of devising the conditional distribution of the future given the past from data to a problem of regression of expected signatures and signatures. OK, thanks. OK, great. Um, perhaps we can um, unmute and thank Terry. Yeah, absolutely. Talk. Thank you very much, everybody. Could I just ask a very quick question? So some people had difficulty following your talk. Is it possible to make the slides available later? Yeah, of course. And I think we've agreed that we're recording it too, right? Yes, yes. But it will yeah. take a little bit of time for the recording yeah. to be kind of available. Of course, of course. Right. Bye. Brilliant. Thanks. OK, so sorry, a round of applause for Terry. That's right. Um, and uh, perhaps a few minutes before our next talk from Lucas. So we'll start again in perhaps three or four minutes. Should I share the screen? Yeah. yeah, if you want to get ready. Yep. Um. Okay, maybe we just go. Oh yeah, it's Teams, so you don't see. Um, I don't see myself, <laughs> and I don't see anyone else. Yes. It happened to me once I was giving a talk at the uh, was this um, machine learning and finance seminar that uh, I lost the connection <laughs> and I didn't quite realize that. <laughs> so you didn't. OK, so you were just talking to yourself. So, so I, you know, I was talking to myself for like, you know, good five, I don't know, seven minutes. <laughs> like and people started calling me on my mobile, but then I say, like, why, why would I? <laughs> I was in the phone during my talk, right? <laughs> and, uh,
Okay, so there is a question in the chat for Terry, but maybe I don't know if Terry's still around. Um, anyway, perhaps uh, we could start with our next talk. So our next speaker is, is Lucas Spruik from the University of Edinburgh, who is going to tell us about neural SDEs, stochastic controls and gradient flows. Thanks, Alex, uh, and, and thanks organizers for um, uh, inviting me to present this work. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, so I want to talk, zoom in to one of the slides that Terry at the end, he mentioned um, this idea of neural uh, neural SDEs, uh, and I want to talk uh, on that a little bit more um, and give you more details. But first, I want to take a um, um, step back and compare two paradigms, the classical modeling um, pre-neural networks uh, world and, you know, modern approaches that people are experimenting with uh, that go under the banner uh, generative modeling. So um, when we think about model selection um, and, you know, particularly I'm interested in applications in, in, in finance and economics, but that's not, not so important. Um, you know, how we would go about selecting a model. Um, you know, we would gather some data, analyze the statistical properties, um, try to um, understand, identify some stylized facts, and then we would handcraft um, parsimonious model that would best capture um, that data, that, that, that patterns that, that we've observed. And then we would calibrate and, and validate, and typically that process, you know, will be a, a back and forth. You know, in finance, for example, there is a, a, a very long history where people started with very simple models, um, like geometric Brownian motion, and now they're working with, uh, I don't know, rough volatility type models. Um, uh, and re so re over time, refining, analyzing data more and refining re refining models. And in, in general, the model complexity um, wasn't desirable property. We were trying to capture and describe the phenomena that is in front of us with a um, uh, small number of parameters. And so advantages of that, that these parameters of the model uh, had a meaning, you know, there were there for a reason because we were trying to model something that we, you know, observe, understood. Um, because those um, models with a few parameters are typically easier to calibrate, we need less data to calibrate them, and we have, you know, several decades of underpinning research. Um, uh, these advantages of this simpler, smaller models is perhaps that um, I would argue that we don't have a, um, a systematic framework for model selection. Um, often this is a little bit ad hoc. Um, you know, someone comes and has expertise working with certain class of models and, and therefore he will deploy them uh, and use them rather than try to really, you know, um, explore what's possible um, because there is a small number of parameters in those models that are not that expressive and 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 you know we often restrict ourselves like i said to some class of models and we don't know what we are what, what we're missing on the other hand now so there's a classical paradigm now the the, the, the there's this modern approaches um using neural networks you know generative modeling two success stories uh, um, there go under the name generally of adversarial networks of variational autoencoders. Um, this works a little bit differently. So um, the, what we after, we're trying to find a, a model that um, fits some distribution. Um, so the setting is we start with some typically latent distribution called mu um, and target distribution nu. This could be on the path space. Um, we treat this as our input output data. I mean, typically this would be empirical approximations. And then um, the idea of the generative model is to, to transport uh, or translate the simple distribution mu into, into new um, the target. Uh, and the way um, this is done uh, by computer scientists, they, they, they parameterize this transport, that function that shifts distribution mu to new. And typically, this is done by a uh, hugely over-parameterized neural network. Uh, and then we seek some a parameter um, that will do the job. And of course, to measure 
that distance between the what we've obtained uh, and, and 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 the target measure, so the good fit, we need to select the metric, and there is you know many different choices. Um, a popular one uh, would be um, the the one I wrote. So we you compare expected values over some class of uh, functions f, and maybe you take a supremum over that. So if if this k would be a, a Lipschitz function, this would be Wasserstein distance. Um, uh, if it's bounded functions, total variation, and so on and so forth. You know, there's many many different metrics that you can you can select. Um, and so the idea here is to I would I wouldn't maybe argue that this is a, a model, but the 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 key thing that to observe that um, those modeling choices are not uh, explicit; they're implicit. So they're hiding in the choice of the metric D that we select at the training stage. Um, they they rely on parametrization of t. How exactly we approximate um, um, this this map t? What sort of a neural network architecture or, or, or machine learning model? And then it um, because often in this in this uh, um, modern approach with starting with mega sorry meta model uh, um, that contains many possible uh, solutions that is typically. There are many fetas, many theta stars that will give you a good fit. And then the choice of the training algorithm uh, also um, dictates what model has been selected. Um, so this is unlike with a simpler model where typically, you know, we start maybe with, in, in case of linear models, you know, you have a data and you're trying to find best possible model um, uh, spun by some say basis functions and you know there is one unique uh, set of weights um, that will do that for given loss function here, uh, there might be many possible choices, right? So these are these Im implicit uh, modeling decisions that that uh, uh, are not often thought of as modeling decisions. Um, but advantages of that is that, um, you know, we've witnessed that this, this, this kind of approach can work quite well in high dimensions and in particular in the situations where um, it's not obvious how to build the model, or it's not obvious what the good feature space is. Think about you know images and, and translating pixels um, uh, in some classification uh, setting, uh, and they, they're data driven. Um, disadvantages, you know, typical the the, the parameters that don't have particular particular meaning. Um, it takes quite a bit of quite a lot of data to actually train those models, and and I would argue that despite the tremendous research and effort that is going into this, this is still a um, um, largely empirical um, uh, approach. There are no standardized benchmarks. The, the, the theory does not f fully cover all the things that are being done. And there's lots of tricks and engineering um, going on that makes these things work. OK, so um, uh, these neural SDEs, um, that I want to um, briefly um, talk about today is an idea that how we could, could combine um, the classical uh, modeling approaches with this more modern, more expressive um, ideas emerging from, uh, from computer science. I'm doing this here in the context of stochastic differential equations because we had in mind a particular application in finance, but this could be any time series model, in fact, any model. The, 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 the idea here is that, um, so in this particular context, I have one, one model, um, this equation S, that in this financial application describes the evolution of the price on the market, and V um, is a model that describes an evolution of the volatility on the market. And 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 by working with this system of two um, equations, I'm making a, a modeling assumption. I think that this is sensible um, to model uh, assets on the market by this two-dimensional two stochastic uh, differential equation driven by the Brownian motion. So that's my modeling choice. Um, what I don't know is how to select the coefficients of this equation. And you know here what we do in in place of the diffusion coefficient of volatility of the price process, we're plugging in neural network. And the same you can plug neural networks 
here in the uh, drift and the diffusion of volatility process. But again, you know, th there are modeling choices. You know, for example, you know, I could observe historical data and realize that um, volatility is mean reverting and actually I can just I, I know what it is I I, I believe I, I know that um, for the kind of data I'm trying to analyze what's what sensible choice of this function B is so maybe I could just model this or handcraft that part and 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 there might be parts of my model that I'm not so sure about um, and maybe these are the parts that I want to uh, model by um, neural network um, and so the idea there is that even though you're using neural network because you're using them in the context of a specific model, specific setting that you understand, you're gaining some understanding what you're actually doing because I know that here I'm looking for a function that plays a role of volatility of my price process and this function plays a, is, plays a role of volatility of volatility. Uh, so these are things that I measure and so I know what I'm approximating versus, you know, just throwing in uh, big over a big over parameterized model uh, at, at data. And again, you know, um, this could be path dependent. Um, they don't need to, you don't need to take Brownian motions. You can take, you know, a jumps, whatever, whatever, whatever you like. Um, this is just an example. Um, so again, from the fin finance perspective, there are some good properties here that um, by working with, uh, uh, with SDEs, I, I um, uh, I can guarantee that the model I generated uh, does not lead to the arbitrage. Uh, um, in particular, you know, here I have just uh, interest rate R, and and I'm you know if I impose some good conditions on my sigma, I can immediately guarantee that that the S is a, a martingale. Um, I can. This is just a comment. Um, Having that again, structure of the model uh, allows me to, even though I'm bringing some neural networks, um, I'm, I'm using model that is well understood um, in finance, the system of, of stochastic differential equations. So I can translate and use methods and mathematics that has been developed over the last you know, 30, 40 years to manipulate that in particular, I can change between different pricing measures and, 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 and real world measures. Um, um, and like I said, you know, this using this can mitigate some of the uh, concerns that, for example, regulators might have when we're trying to bring those more complicated models because, you know, I'm using this within a model that is, um, um, well, relatively well understood. Um, we weren't the only ones, as Terry mentioned, you know, the, uh, Terry um, and, and his group, they've, they've done some works on this. There was uh, Josef Teichmann, Krista Cushero, they did a, a work um, uh, on, on similar models. And um, Chris Salvi and um, uh, and, and um, uh, oh, I forgot the first name. Um, uh, with students of of theory, we, we, we look into uh, replacing the neural networks with signatures, uh, and you can also um, you can also study those models. Imano, sorry, that well, escaped me. Um, okay, so this is the um, the idea, and then. Um, Again, here I, I will just demonstrate it, that this could work in a very specific application. So application that we had in mind is that we were using this model in the context of financial applications that uh, this type of models are being used to price um, derivatives. And so the idea is that you have uh, market data, so these are the prices of some derivatives uh, traded on the market. So this phi i represents here the pay payoff. Um, this expected value um, uh, parameterized by theta corresponds to the expected value or price of the derivative computed with this model um, x theta. And, and we want to make sure that we find the parameters or we learn the coefficients of this equation such that the model produces the same prices as uh, I observe on the market. So this is this part, um, what is this doing? So to translating this to the statistical pro properties, the, the prices on the market give you some information about uh, some approximation to the marginal time marginal distributions of your of your process 
and you try to and you try to construct a a, a, um, a model such that you hit those um, uh, prescribed um, um, time marginal distributions. But at the same time, you might be interested in um, in finding. So I want to, my model to be calibrated, but um, once it is calibrated, I want to use it to price some other derivatives, some other products, or maybe compute some risks um, um, that for which I don't have data. And uh, again, to express this idea that we are working um, here with this neural SDs, this is a whole family of models parameterized by theta. So different, different choices of um, theta effectively gives you different functions, uh, this uh, sigma s, sigma v, and bv, and that effectively uh, produces a different model. So there, because the constraint that you're imposing is that you only you want to find a model that has you know certain marginal distribution that agree with your market data, there are many models that will do that. And so how you do select the one um, uh, that you want to use for, like I said, computed, uh, computing these other expectations. So the the idea here is, and this is related um, a, a little bit to uh, the work Alex has been doing on robust uh, uh, finance, that maybe you might you might be interested in computing a price interval. So find a model within this class of stochastic differential equations parameterized with the neural networks, such that they are calibrated to data, but you are interested in the minimum and maximal price of certain products, okay? So you're not fully robust in the sense that you're not looking for any possible stochastic process that agrees with the market data, but you're looking for a specific class of models, uh, uh, those namely those stochastic differential equations with coefficients modeled by the neural network. But I would argue that's a fairly large class of models. And so then what you do, you, um, you, um, uh, you implement this idea. Um, so this is just a brief um, uh, algorithm how you do that. So you know, as, as I said, you just um, in this first um, you, you discretize you discretize your SD with some uh, um, say Euler discretization or whatever whatever you want to work with. You collect your market inputs, and here in this first epoch, what you do you um, calibrating your model. Um, and this is your model to market prices. And to make it work, uh, we realize that, uh, or to make it efficient, we realize that uh, this Monte Carlo type uh, calibration um, is challenging due to the large variance. So we reduce the variance by, by um, subtracting a, a, a hedging strategy or think about this as a control variant. Uh, and for people working on finance, this is just a, um, a term that arises in Martingale representation theorem. So once you have this, we want to learn two things. We want to learn our model, and we want to learn um, a, a good hedging strategy on this control variant. Uh, so in the second iteration, what we do, we fix our model. And for this fixed model, we try to find a, uh, a good variance reduction, uh, a good control variant or hedging strategy such that the, the variance uh, uh, is minimized. And we iterate this. And at the end, um, what we have, we have a model. Um, calibrated model and, and a hedging strategy. So some pictures. Um, so we've tested this on on um, both synthetic and empirical, uh, sorry, synthetic and, 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 and real data, market data. Uh, and here you see a fit of um, uh, to the prices quoted on the market. So this is the the left side um, and on the right uh, side of this, you see the fit to the implied volatility uh, for 10 different calibrated models. And, and we look at this at different uh, maturities, that is time, time marginals um, of your model. And uh, this robust bit, uh, just to highlight the fact that the fact that if you know because you work with a class of still other parameterized models, you don't have unique solution. We were computing um, uh, here the prices of a specific financial payoff. In this context, this was a lookback option, uh, and we were computing this minimal and maximum price. 
Um, and and um, so these are these blue uh, box plots, um, and the gray ones are giving you accuracy of the of the of the calibration. So we see that all of them um, we, we're getting an errors at the level of 10 to minus 7, 10 to minus 8. So that's pretty good. Uh, and indeed, we are able to produce those price intervals, the bounds um, uh, for those expectations that you're interested. And the guy in the middle, the, the, the blue box in the middle, is what you get randomly. You know, without without select without computing this maximal and minimal uh, um, and uh, this bounds estimates, you know, you just run your stochastic gradient and you train your model uh, and you pick one random solution. So we just plotted this that, you know, as as expected, uh, it lands some somewhere in the middle. But um, typically, this is random and you don't know exactly which one. You, you know, like I said, the combination of the loss function, network architecture, and the training method. Um, will uh, will um, effectively um, uh, in, uh, uh, select <laughs> which which one of this whole family of models you 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 um you landed on um so some extensions here again from the finance perspective you can incorporate additional market information for example in the training you can maybe add bound on the realize variance of your process by adding additional constraints so then again you know um, a question here um, that you are asking is saying i want to find a model that sort of that looks like an sd um, uh, such that i fit um, available data market data um, but i'm interested in the model that has some additional properties and and you can you can incorporate them um, uh, one big application is again what uh, what uh, Terry has mentioned is that <laughs> the type of models are then being used as um, generators or data generators for in, in the pipeline of um, the say hedging. So this is Hans Bueller, the quant risk uh, um, where GP Morgan built a software for. Uh, automating the uh, derivatives pricing. They want to compute um, hedging strategies by solving a large um, scale optimization problem, but they need a lot of data. And so they artificially can and generate the data using various approaches, and that could be one of them. Okay, so this is the uh, um, first part um, application. The second part of my talk, um, I want to talk a little bit about my maths. Um, so what actually we can prove about this uh, and what are what are the advantages additional advantages of combining um those machine learning type models with 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 the things that that, that we're familiar with and in particular this sdes uh, so we don't have uh, all answers here but i just want to present you one one idea uh, that um, we are working and the other groups are working on and so this is mean field perspective of on, on neural networks. Uh, so this is one slight summary of what is going on. So on the left-hand side, so the theory at the moment is uh, fully developed for a very simple toy example um, called one hidden layer neural network. Um, so what is this guy is doing? You have some input Z, you multiply it by a vector of weights, uh, take a nonlinear activation function, again, multiply by some weights, and, 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 and then you average all your outputs and you apply this mean field one over n scaling and the reason you do that is that uh, you can rewrite this guy as expected value with respect to the empirical distribution nu n and once you do that you immediately see that um, this function on the left hand side this even this very simple one hidden layer when you're optimizing directly of the, the parameters uh, or the weights beta and alpha, this is uh, in general non-convex problem, even if your loss is convex, and this is due to nonlinearity of this activation function that typically is non-convex. But when you abstract things up um, and you start viewing this one hidden neural network as a function of a measure, measure over um, over the parameter space, then this becomes linear uh, and, and, and convex in particular. So what we're doing here, we take a finite dimensional problem that is non-convex, 
and we are translating this into infinite dimensional problem that becomes convex. And then for this, there is pretty much a whole theory developed. Um, people proved convergence of gradient descents, convergence rates, um, and uh, you can do a lot of mathematics. And, and I would argue that you know this one hidden layer neural network is uh, um, um, uh, really well understood by now. Um, the slight extension of this, or maybe not so slight, is again using um, ideas from uh, ODEs you could con or control theory. Uh, you can try to extend this one hidden layer neural network to um, um, recurrent neural network. So what you do, you take, a, you consider this uh, ordinary control differential equation, and at each um, T time marginal, um, so this is some, again, abstraction, the model for infinitely many layers, but you can discretize this in time. At each time step, you approximate your coefficient by one hidden neural network. So that gives you a, a particular architecture. You don't need to be linear here. Um, and the challenge here is that that, that observation that we had from the um, uh, one hidden layer neural network story that we took non-convex problem and we translated it, it to convex doesn't hold anymore because now you see that your um, uh, coefficient depends on x and x depends on u and so we, we lose convexity here. But the good news is that still using classical control theory, um, we can we can analyze this and we've done that and many other people also were doing various works around that. And um, so going back to this um, neural stochastic differential equation, I want to show you some mathematics, what, 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 what we've done recently about uh, trying to prove uh, in some, like I said, this abstract setting that the stochastic gradient descent algorithms that are being used um, in machine learning actually may work. Um, Again, this is some abstraction. This doesn't fully cover what I've presented in the first part of the talk, but it's, it's, it just presents types of mathematics and, and results that one can use. So um, a, a specific example of this neural, um, if you like, SDE is linking to my previous slide, is you consider this control stochastic differential equation, where just to fix attention, you might think about this coefficient as the this um, uh, one hidden layer neural networks or recurrent neural networks. Um, it's not so important. Um, but you think about this control new as a distribution of a of, of a parametrization of your function of driven diffusion coefficient. Um, so you view you view distribution of a parameters as a control, measured value control of your um, stochastic differential equation. Um, and in a control theory, you know, we have this controlled uh, stochastic differential equation. Uh, um, we then um, want to optimize a function. So the objective function, the typical um, that is studied is of this form where you have some running cost. Um, that is the cost of um, along the um, uh, trajectories uh, that you can model. There is some terminal cost. Um, for example, you, you're interested in your trajectories hitting um, certain targets. And here we re regularize with um, uh, entropy. I, I don't have a huge amount of time. This is um, um, this has some good properties. This helps with mathematics. Um, um, and there are some other perspectives of using this controls, um, control neural um, stochastic differential equations in the context of reinforcement learning. Um, uh, where we um, that helps with an exploration and other things. At the moment, thing about is that we're adding this for mathematical convenience. So this is entropy with respect to some Gibbs measure. This essentially allows us to regularize our problem uh, and express some uh, prior information. What we believe the good distribution of a, of a parameters of my neural SDEs are. And I consider here the standard control um, um, function in one could generalize this to, to consider sort of mean field nonlinear versions of that. And the theory wouldn't change too much. Um, and so the benefit of that perspective, this control perspective is that we can tap 
on, on, on research uh, that has been done in stochastic control theory and try to understand training from that perspective. Um, again, um, there, there is a, a very useful way to characterize what it means to solve this control problem, what it means to find this optimal distribution of uh, parameters of my, my, my coefficients. Um, goes to Pontragin, or it's called stochastic maximum principle, which essentially tells you that your optimal uh, or locally optimal control uh, pointwise minimizes certain function called in theory of stochastic control Hamiltonian. Um, and this process, process X is the one that you've seen on the first slide, Y is, and Y and Z are sort of adjunct processes. Um, Again, the mathematics is if you have, if you haven't seen this uh, before, it's it's um, it's sophisticated. But once you once you've seen it, it's, it's actually uh, um, not that bad. The point is here that now uh, we've translated the, the problem of learning the parameters into uh, optimization problem over this uh, this Hamiltonian, and it turns out. Um, and so we want what we want to do. We want to understand whether a prototype or some abstraction of stochastic gradient descent algorithms used in, 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 in machine learning community uh, uh, could work and can we prove that it converges. Um, and again, um, what we need to ask the question, okay, now I work in this infinite dimensional space of distributions of a parameters, you know, what is the right notion of, um, of gradient or gradient descent? And, and um, there is a, um, a lot of beautiful work coming from optimal transportation literature that um, gives, uh, gives some in good intuition what this could be. So in particular, if your topology over those uh, distributions is given by the Wasserstein 2 distance, um, which is quite um, popular, has good properties, then there is a famous result uh, that goes on the uh, uh, Dubenamo de, de Brenier um, uh, that gives a dynamic representation of this Wasserstein distance. So this Wasserstein distance is measuring the distance between those measures mu zero uh, uh, and mu one, um, and so you're minimizing over all couplings over all join laws such that the, the marginals of this pi, the, the first marginal is mu zero and the second marginal is mu one. So this is a classical definition. And one can show that this is the dynamic representation of that is that you, you take this um, partial differential equation, um, uh, you start this with mu zero and you want this equation to transport your distribution to mu one and you optimize over this vector field um, new here. Um, so that's that's the intuition uh, why this type of PD is the right, um, right um, type of uh, a gradient flow. So we do that. So here we, we like I said, that we've added this entropy. So we, um, we unpack this a little bit. So um, this entropy, this extra regularization gives you this term and that's mathematically convenient. Um, that just tells you that this PD has a nice uh, and smooth solution. But uh, there is this vector field B that you're trying to find. And the benefit of this uh, representation, maybe, you know, it's not so common to work with PDEs in, in, in machine learning, but you can write a probabilistic representation of this uh, equation, uh, which, um, which, is, which means that we're looking for a uh, a stochastic process such that the law of this stochastic process will precisely give you the distribution of this PD. And it turns out that this equation is of this form. And so you see that this dxt you, um, subject to this ve vector field could be seen as a sort of a gradient descent. Imagine this bt was minus derivative of your function and, and you're adding a little bit of noise because I've added a little bit of regularization with entropy. So you do a little bit of maths and the, check, and the idea is, you know, how to find B, how to find this vector field in my gradient flow su such that I'm minimizing my cost. And you do a little bit of mathematics and you can do that. Um, and it looks complicated, but um, um, we have a full description. So we have this process D theta. So this is my probabilistic representation. Sorry, being inconsistent with the notation. Uh, it's my probabilistic representation for the gradient flow. So you see that I have something minus derivative um, 
uh, as you would expect, this part comes from the regularization uh, with respect to this uh, uh, the prior information that I impose on my controls, and 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 this is due to um, this uh, adding entropy, and this is coupled with the system of uh, control equation and its adjoint in this representation. Uh, there is no need to worry about that. But the point is that now this we translated the problem of learning the parameters into studying the convergence of this idealized continuous time gradient uh, descent. I'll skip the details how you could compute that. And, and indeed, we can show that the optimal solution to our control problem, the optimal measure, is given by this equation. Um, so um, here it is an equation because you have mu star on both sides of this. Um, but at least can be written explicitly. And it turns out that this, this gradient flow is an equation, um, that th this mu star is an invariant measure, uh, and this equation uh, one s time s goes to infinity converges to that. And we can show that this mu star is actually a unique global minimizer. And if we have enough convexity uh, in our problem, um, we can prove that uh, this gradient flow converges exponentially fast to the optimal distribution. So this is a, a bit of abstraction at the moment, but um, just to say that uh, working with this um, models that combine some ideas from machine learning with more classical objects that we understand and have lots of mathematics about gives us also a chance to prove and understand um, uh, why the stochastic gradient descent type algorithms used in practice actually work. So I stop there and happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Lucas. Do we have any questions from the audience? Actually, how an iPad? <laughs> <laughs> Questions from there. Casino, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think you had a question. Um, yes, it, it's it's really impressive work, and it seems magic that you can put in a newer network and get analytic results. Well, um, so I think um, the I think this slide captures this best. Uh, so I think this 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 first part, you know, it's okay. Um, this is very simple neural networks. Neural network uh, is in the specific uh, mean field regime. It's not. Uh, this is not too crazy in a sense that this idea on mean field basically says, you know, if I have a bigger and bigger model. Uh, with more and more parameters, the impact of each parameter is less and less. So that's sort of sensible. Um, this observation that uh, your problem becomes convex, and then you can mathematically uh, uh, bootstrap this to prove some convergence at the level of this abstract uh, infinite dimensional object, and then project it back by discretizing uh, using numerical uh, numerical um, approximation theory back to original problem. Yes, this is quite nice, <laughs> uh, but uh, it's it's once you go, you know, it was a quick talk about fairly um, maybe complicated stuff. As we go to this ODE or this deeper neural networks or this SDEs to get convergence there, there are assumptions. So um, there is a lot of a lot of um, uh, a lot of regularization or quite strong regularization required at the moment to prove uh, mathematically um, uh, something. Um, so we're not, we, you know, we, we're not. Um, the problem for the deep neural networks is is, is far from being solved. <laughs> But it provides perspective. It's uh, it's provide interesting perspective and it gives you a mathematical toolbox. Um, uh, to think about this more systematically. Exactly, but neural networks, they are not given by God, right? So you can your uh, theoretical results inform which type of neural network architectures could work well? And you already show that one hidden layer would work well in this respect, but not so, um, so in one, the first paper, 
uh, that kind of properly mathematically uh, um, exploited this observation for one hidden neural network is a work by Andrea Montanari uh, mm -hmm. and, and his group from, from Stanford. And, you know, it's, um, I, I do strongly recommend. Uh, he writes a lot. <laughs> And he writes very long papers. <laughs> so, so, uh, but uh, the the work is really good. Um, and in the first paper that he wrote, which is published in, uh, uh, it's funny, it's it's hundred pages in in publishing proceeding of National Academy of Science. So you have eight pages paper and 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 ninety two or three pages appendix. Uh, but there, um, he what he 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 derived as PDE for the distribution of a parameter space. And then he was, they've done some numerical approximations to be able to predict what the stochastic gradient in practice may do. So they've tried to use that. Um, I don't think that this idea gained much traction in machine learning community, um, but the, the, certainly there's more theoretical people in machine learning uh, now are using this framework of working with measures or mm -hmm. distributions of a parameter space and they realize that this is extremely powerful. You know, you, you you know, you can bring all the machinery of um, gradient flows theory, optimal transportation, and 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 really um, um, at this abstract level understand a little bit more what is going on. So I think this is the the main for me uh, main conceptual shift from the move moving away from the parameters. Uh, to start uh, talking about the distribution of a parameter space in the sense that if you train your neural network or you train your machine learning big of a parameterized model, the weights, the, the particular values of the weights are not important. But if there is, um, they come from certain distribution, so you might, each time you run your Monte Carlo, which effectively what stochastic gradient is doing to some extent, uh, you might have different values, but they make sense because they are samples from certain distribution. So I think this is this is um, 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 interesting and, and 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 fruitful observation. Thank you. Thanks. So uh, we're running a bit over schedule, um, but it would probably so perhaps in the interest of time, uh, stop there with the questions for Lukas. But um, perhaps people could. A round of applause again for Lucas. Thank you.